here. Switching over to Eric. Muted. This is Eric. Okay. All right. Okay. I can't hear anything, so uh, I'll just have to trust you can hear me. All right. Thanks. Bye. All right. Well, my name is Eric Anderson, and I, I took ME571 Building Performance Simulation for Integrated Design during the fall semester of last year, 2013. This course introduced the concepts of energy modeling for the software tool Energy Plus. And before taking this class, I had no experience with Energy Plus. However, I had performed one commercial building energy model using eQuest. The presentation that follows highlights my final project submitted for this course. There were two related objectives specified for this project. The first objective was that we used the knowledge we had gained over the course of the semester to develop an energy model of a new or existing building. The second objective was to develop an additional model for the same building, except that the second model needed to reflect proposed modifications that we believed would result in a decrease in the energy consumption of the building. Since we were given a lot of freedom in choosing the building we wanted to model, I chose to model an existing building that is close to where I work. The building is a commercial printing facility located in Pensacola, Florida. Pensacola, Florida excuse me. And since it's located on the Gulf Coast, it's characterized by a very hot and humid climate. It's almost tropical. The first step in the modeling process is to gather as much information about the building as you can. And having this information on the front end of model construction definitely saves time and frustration that comes with making modifications to the model at an inconvenient point in the process. Now, the sources I was able to come up with for the model of this building included old blueprints, submittal documents, data labels on the equipment, interviews with facility personnel such as the equipment operators, technicians, and the building manager, and from notes taken while I was walking around the facility. And obviously, um, not all of these sources are always available, but I had the luxury of having these. And once I gathered all the information I could, I began the actual construction of the building model. And uh, we were showing how to do this using three tools, uh, including SketchUp, Open Studio, and the EP Launcher. And I suppose these tools aren't necessary if you're familiar with Energy Plus, but it definitely makes it uh, very easy. Uh, SketchUp provides an easy-to-use graphical means for constructing the building geometry for the model. The building geometry defined in SketchUp is then used in Open Studio, which provides predetermined construction sets as well as load profiles and schedules for typical building types, all of which provide a good starting point for defining the basics of the model. And once this is done, the EP Launcher allows you to refine the model and define more complex components and definitions. This slide provides a snapshot of the printing facility's building geometry. It is an 87,000 square foot facility that has gone through multiple expansions and additions over the years. Because of these additions, there are varying roof, roof heights throughout the building. 
But this isn't a single level building except for the pre-press area, which has two floors. There are very few windows and doors in the building, but there are eight roll-up doors located at the front loading dock. There are three overhangs on the building exterior, the most significant one being at the front loading dock. And I decided to divide the building into 40 distinct thermal zones. And this slide demonstrates how I divided the building into those thermal zones, some of which included unconditioned zones such as mechanical rooms, board room, and stairwell. The two floors of the pre-press area are served by a multi-zone unit, so I've divided this area into several small zones, which may have been a mistake, but that's the way I did it. Several spaces in this building are served by multiple air handlers. So I went ahead and divided these larger spaces into individual thermal zones reflecting the zoning of air handling units. These heavy red lines depict the divisions of single spaces represented by multiple zones. So there are actually no internal walls where these red lines are shown. Now to model these areas, I deleted the walls between the zones since they did not exist. Now although Energy Plus did not like this and threw up some errors about minimum number of surfaces in the zones not being sufficient, it still successfully performed the simulation, so I didn't uh, mess with it, I just left it alone. However, I think for future models I would just give the walls a zero thermal mass or possibly just represent the space as one zone and define all the air handling units serving that zone as a single large unit. In this slide you can see the resulting building geometry once the SketchUp definition was complete. In this view, you can see the zoning layout, the different roof elevations, and the shading structures, which are represented by the purple surfaces. As mentioned previously, Open Studio is used to define the construction materials and layer definitions of the different surfaces. Since this is a metal building, I began with the warehouse template in Open Studio, and then used the CBEX 1980-2004 to default construction set for Climate Zone 2. Once this default information was in place, I modified the material properties to match information from the blueprints and what I noticed from my site visits. And you can see that information there as far as R values, U values, and the uh, visible light tra transmitters, for instance, for the glazing systems. And with the construction materials defined, I was ready to define the HVAC systems. There are 18 constant volume chilled water air handling units serving this building. The building automation controls in this facility are pretty old, uh, some not as old as others, so for the most part there is very little capability for multiple PID loop control or supply air reset strategies. There is one PTAC with electric heat located in the maintenance shop. Most of the air handlers uh, have reheat and that reheat provided by uh, both electric duct heaters and hot water coils. Now the set points throughout the building were pretty consistent from unit to unit, about 73 degrees for cooling and 70 degrees for heating. Now because this is a printing facility, there's lots of paper in the facility and, and humidity is concerned, so that has to be controlled. And the schedules for the units have them running 24-7. This table represents the air handling unit data I was able to find either in the blueprints or in things like test and balance reports. So yeah, as you can see, I was able to obtain, obtain a lot of information, and that was a great benefit in creating this model. Now, many of the units do not have any outside air, and I found that some of the units have their outside air dampers currently shut off. I simply modeled the units the way I found them. The chill water system for this facility is served by what I'll call a district loop. And to model this, I gave the chiller a high COP of about 10,000 so that the chiller electric load would effectively be zero and not show up in the building model. So the chiller plant power wouldn't be seen in the building itself. Now the existing boiler is a natural gas water tube boiler with a maximum efficiency of 80%. So once I had the, the HVAC system designed, it was time to define the equipment loads for each zone. And this table here represents the information I was able to obtain off of the equipment labels. Um, I went to every piece of equipment to, to look this up. Most of the KW loads shown here represent fractions of what I read from the units uh, due to part load operation. 
some of which I just guessed at, and some were estimates based on operating load estimates provided by the equipment operators. I, I do want you to notice the second load that's listed there in this table. It represents a natural gas load for burners built into two large presses in the facility, and I'm going to reference that later. The lighting in this facility uses both fluorescent and metal halide fixtures. Fortunately, a lighting survey had been performed for this facility, so I was conveniently provided with actual fixture locations, counts, loads, uh, even including the ballast factor, so that was very convenient. Uh, the lighting schedule uh, for weekdays is from 5 a.m. to 6 p.m., and then at other times, weekends and evenings, I reduced the load to 5% for security lighting. Now associated with the natural gas load that was listed in the previous equipment table is a process cooling load necessary for setting the ink of the, the presses. I estimated this process cooling load at about 100 tons based on the capacity of the heat exchangers coupling the chill water system to the presses. And I'll explain how I define this process cooling load a little later. Uh, here are some of the other loads in the building. I obtained the number of occupants and schedule of operation from the facility manager. The infiltration load set at 0.74 air changes per hour was the default value from the warehouse template in Open Studio. Uh, there were four small electric hot water heaters. I assume these to be very uh, small and insignificant compared to the rest of the equipment. So with the building geometry, construction, loads, and schedules defined, it was time to run the model and analyze my output. This is the point where calibration of the model begins. Now the building owner was able to provide me with annual electric, chilled water tonnage, and natural gas consumptions for the building. So I was able to compare my model output results with the building's actual energy consumption for each of those utilities. And when I compared these results, um, each of these utilities in my model needed some tuning. So I began the calibration process by tuning the equipment electrical loads. Since I was confident that the lighting definitions were fairly accurate, and since the HVAC equipment was constant speed running 24-7, I figured the greatest variable was in the equipment load definitions. So I went through the process of adjusting the equipment design levels shown here in this slide until the model electric output was close to the actual power bills. Next, I calibrated the heating and cooling loads, which was more difficult than calibrating the equipment electrical loads. This was an iterative process that involved modeling or modifying the infiltration air changes per hour, as well as the equipment loads fraction loss factor, which basically determines how much the electrical load is converted to heat and introduced into the space. Now, changes to each of these factors had effects on both the heating and cooling loads. For instance, increasing or increases to both the air changes per hour and heat generated by the equipment will increase the building cooling load. However, increases to both have opposite effects on the heating load. So I spent a lot of time going back and forth adjusting these parameters until I was satisfied with the results. I mentioned earlier that there was a process cooling load needed for setting the ink in two of the presses. Although I'm not sure um, although I'm sure it is there somewhere, I could not find an energy plus any way for defining a process load on the chilled water system. So the way I defined it was by adjusting the fraction loss factor of the gas burner load to introduce heat into the space equal to the process cooling load. And then I just allowed the, the air handling unit to serve in that area to pick up that load. And I thought in this way the chilled water system would have to account for it. The values here represent the final load densities, infiltration air changes per hour, and process cooling load values once the calibration process was over. And as you can see, the equipment, electrical, and gas load densities are fairly high. As you can see in this slide, the final values of the calibrated model were very close to the actual utility data for the building. The natural gas load represented my largest error, and it was just over 6%. As I mentioned earlier, I spent a great deal of time in the calibration process to achieve these results. But before moving on to the next slide, I just want to point out the energy use intensity for this building. 
which you see listed in the table is just over 500,000 kBTU per square foot. I wanted to see how the EUI of this building compared to other printing facilities. So I looked through the commercial building energy consumption survey data provided by the U.S. Energy Information Administration. CBEX basically is a compilation of average annual energy consumptions for typical commercial buildings throughout the United States. However, as I looked through the tables, I did not see any commercial printing facilities listed. In fact, anywhere online I had a lot of trouble finding information for printing facilities. The closest thing I could find to any kind of print shop in the CBEX data was something similar to such like a maybe a Kinko's. So finally in table C3A I found an other category which included manufacturing facilities, which I figured to be my best option for making any comparisons. The listed average EUI, which happened to be the highest in the entire table, was given as 164.4 kBTU per square foot. So obviously the EUI, the pr printing facility I was modeling, was way too high and would offer a great opportunity for energy savings. At this point I began to work on the second objective of modeling proposed energy improvements to the building. Now listed here are the three options I proposed. I chose to convert most of the constant volume air handling units to variable volume systems through the use of variable speed drives. Now I chose this option based upon success I've had in the past with this technique. It works well in humid climates that require low cold depth temperatures to control humidity because this often results in an overcooling of the space and thus requiring weak reheat. But by reducing the volume of cold air from the air handling unit, fan energy is saved, but more importantly, uh, reheat energy is saved. The second proposal I chose really involves what I deal with every day, and that is DDC controls. By replacing the older controls with newer, more powerful controls, reset strategies, complex control logic, and versatility with multiple PID loops expands your options for energy saving sequences of operation. My final proposal was to replace the older conventional boiler with a new condensing boiler with an increased efficiency. Now, this is another technique I've had success with in the past. By reducing the reheat load through my first proposal, I can usually get away with a lower hot water supply temperature from the boiler, thus making it possible to operate the boiler in condensing mode where it is most efficient. After making the necessary modifications to account for my three energy conservation measures, I re-ran the model and compared the new results with those of the existing model. As you can see in the top table, the total energy consumption of the building was basically cut in half. The bottom chart separates these savings between the different end uses, including heating, cooling, lighting, equipment, fans, pumps, and service hot water. The savings were quite drastic, most obvious in the heating and cooling modes. And this is indicative of a situation where there is a lot of simultaneous cooling and heating. And although the building EUI is still high, it's pretty much been cut in half. Uh, let me just add here uh, real quick um, that I knew ahead of time that I wanted to implement variable volume systems in this building as an ECM. Therefore, when I created the existing model, I made all of the air handling units variable speed to begin with, but force them to run as constant volume by making the minimum supply flow equal to the maximum. Now that way, for the second model, I did not have to recreate all the air handlers. I just simply changed one parameter, the minimum supply air, which allowed the unit fans to modulate per the load requirements. I've included this slide simply because I like the effect that it has on demonstrating the energy reductions realized by the proposed ECMs the dark blue representing the decrease in energy consumption um, really helps the energy savings to stand out. Um, well, this concludes my presentation. Uh, thank you very much for allowing me to share with you uh, my final modeling project from the class Building Performance Simulation for Integrated Design. Thank you.
So. All right, and there will be more uh, questions at, or time for questions at the end also. So we can always come back. Thanks, Eric. Uh, so Thank next you. up we have Sharif Sharif, who is currently a research assistant. Oh. Okay, we're switching mics. All right, so Sharif is currently a research assistant here at the IDL. He is working towards his Master's of Science in Mechanical Engineering. Um, he previously received his Bachelor's in Mechanical Engineering from Ein Shams University in Cairo. Um, he also has some background in MEP design, so industry before coming here to the IDL. Uh, and he has done simulation work for us since about 2012 he joined us, so he has some experience. Uh, for his presentation, he's going to talk to us about his first impressions of Energy Plus as a program, and his general experience in the course, uh, and then his final project as well. For the, He was modeling a potential future technology mall here in Boise. So with that, I give you Sharif. Uh, hang on just a second, Katie. Um, we need Eric to switch uh, presenters really quick. Eric, you have the control of the online webinar. Oh. It's not coming through yet. All right, Eric, you still there? Uh, if you could hit the uh, change presenter tab, uh, where did... Huh. Eric, log out. Eric must have logged out. All right, let me just change presenters. Okay. All right, um, so before I start talking about my uh, final uh, project for this class, I just want to go through uh, my, my first experience with uh, Energy Plus about two years ago when I started using Energy Plus. Um, uh, I came, uh, before I came to IDL, I was working in building design uh, for about six years and spent some time working with other simulation programs that have graphical interface uh, that uh, uh, can help you uh, generate your uh, inputs for simulation and run simulation in the interface and get your results graphically. So, uh, okay. There you go. So, uh, this was my f the first simulation program I used. Uh, I use this uh, this program. Uh, this on. <laughs> so uh, I use this software, Adam software, to uh, model uh, my graduation program in uh, in in Shams University. Uh, as we can see, I, I was able to use a graphical interface to uh, start my model, build it, and run it. This this is not my project, but something similar. I was modeling uh, a moving part mechanically and trying to see uh, changes in forces and some physical uh, uh, properties of the of the object I'm modeling. So I was able to uh, build my model and. Uh, run the simulations and get graphics and graphs populated for my outputs. 
So this was my first impression when I started using a simulation program. And then uh, when I was working uh, in building design, I was involved in um, hydraulic, hydraulic design. Um, we designed a lot of um, electric cooling uh, systems that had uh, that we uh, designed uh, distribution networks for the for the system, and we modeled the, we, we created hydraulic models to calculate pressures and uh, uh, flow rates in each part of the uh, piping network. And this also was another example of another software program, uh, another simulation program I used that uh, also had nice interface that let me just deal with drop down menus and um, create inputs and see graphs that the, the program created for me uh, for my output. And then when I was doing building design, I used HEP for uh, load calculations, which had some simulation capabilities, but also I want to show that all what I know about simulation was creating a model from uh, an interface that let me uh, pick choices from pull down menus uh, and then also yeah and get me some nice reports this is an input report that help generates for for the model even before it runs i can view my input and uh, see it in a in a, a kind of a friendly format that lets me uh, easily identify any errors and fix them in the model. And then after I finish input with HEP, uh, I also have a nice, a nice tool that I can request the different reports I need and, and can, I can control, I have a full control on my outputs. And then this is a, an example of one of the outputs that maybe some, some m m many of the, um, Building designers are familiar with the output uh, format from HEP. And then, two years ago, when I started working with Energy Plus, uh, when I saw how how I generate my uh, my model, and I saw the text file from my from my previous experience with modeling, I thought this is too hard. I was surprised that if I, when I tried to create my model for a building, two years ago, uh, Open Studio and SketchUp tool was not really powerful in generating HVAC systems, so we mainly used it for uh, creating the envelope, and we exported IDF from Energy Plus from uh, Open Studio, and and then we are messing with text mode, basically. We are copying and pasting from the documentation for if you want to specify a certain HVAC system, I had to go to the documentation and find how what are the objects are required, how many objects are required to define this particular system and paste them in the, 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 the text file and of course I get errors in the, at the first run and work with the errors and run it again and get another errors. So it wasn't really uh, time, very time efficient to me, it didn't sound time efficient and made me kind of question the uh, uh, accuracy of uh, Energy Plus. But of, of course, everyone knows that this is the, uh, the DOE tool that uh, is a very powerful tool in terms of uh, energy simulation. Uh, but it's not really, it didn't sound very time efficient for me when I started. So, so by, by working with Energy Plus, I uh, started learning that there, will, there, there, are, some, there are some ways to uh, make Generating, creating the model are uh, more uh, faster and more efficient. And you learn this by experience. Uh, so uh, here I'm going to talk about the uh, this course. Uh, before this class, uh, I have been working with IDL doing energy modeling and energy analysis for about a year. And I had, I had a very good feel about uh, using the simulation software Energy Plus and any simulation in general based on my previous design experience. So for me, I kind of had a, a little advantage of over uh, my other colleagues in, in class that I was familiar with the software and familiar with how to uh, 
design buildings and uh, run simulations. So that was a, a good thing uh, for me. Uh, I just want to describe the, uh, the assignment for the final project. There's a lot of text, but I'll get through it pretty quickly. Uh, so we were tasked to develop an energy model for a building uh, and provide a design alternative. So uh, the alternative shall consist of a set of energy efficiency measures. And we were free to choose between an existing building or a new construction. Uh, for the new construction, we were supposed to submit a proposed design and a baseline design. And for existing building, as Eric uh, uh, went through his presentation, uh, it was to submit an existing design and the renovation plan. Uh, and of course, Eri, Eri has some requirements for the building uh, that it has to be approved by him and number of zones must be less than, not less than 10 thermal zones. And he had some, he had, he, he given us a schedule for deliverables and kind of to uh, keep track of what everyone is doing. And uh, I think he used this to uh, grade the project at the end. Every deliverable had a certain uh, credit. Okay, so uh, I decided to uh, go with a new construction building and I went on uh, City of Boise's website. There is a public record for, for all the buildings that are going to planning commission to get approval for land use. And in that record, uh, I found some nice buildings that can be a good fit for my, for my model. Uh, I found on the, for the, on there for public records, uh, plan drawings for this building. I guess it's, it's under construction now and will be open soon in 2014. Uh, I found, uh, floor plans and elevations and the rendering. This was the, the, the rendering image for the, for that building. Everything was uh, available for everyone, uh, on public record on the Boise City website. Uh, at that time, that building was, uh, going to, uh, a hearing before the planning commission to, uh, for approval and for neighbors to, uh, oppose if, you, if they want. Uh, so, uh, I wish this thing works, but, uh, oh. So this was the first floor plan. The building is three story height, uh, and, uh, it's mostly retail. The first floor is retail for, uh, uh, computer uh, vendors to go uh, to, to use it in cubicles and it's open space but they can they have dividers and uh, they're going to be divided uh, into uh, different vendors and uh, we have uh, restrooms and mechanical rooms this is an elevator shaft uh, and there was a, a funny space in the, at the corner that I didn't know what to do with it so I made it as a storage in my model. Uh, second floor was uh, mainly second and third floors are offices that uh, support the uh, the tenants in the first floor. This is second, and this is third floor. Uh, and here is my model. This is the proposed design that I created uh, for the model. And the building, uh, yeah, the building is about uh, the floor area is about eleven thousand square foot. And aspect ratio for the building was two and a half. Uh, number of floors three. Window to wall ratio is about forty percent. I I set this number. Because I, I only had floor plans, I didn't have any other information. So I used my uh, judgment and said, when the window to wall issue it should be about 40% in order for me to utilize some daylighting for my proposed design. And um, so energy, efficient, energy efficiency measures that I created for the model, uh, I modeled it with the VRF heat pumps. So I don't have any central systems. I don't, I don't have plans in, the, in my model. So I picked a VRF system with a OS, dedicated outdoor system with heat recovery that had the ex cooling and uh, natural gas heating. Uh, I implemented in the model um, night flush ventilation during the cooling season. And I set that time from end of May to uh, uh, September, I believe. And I, have, I had uh, daylighting control in the model. And after I ran my model, my average cooling load was about uh, 600 square foot per ton. 
average heating load was about 1100 BTU per hour per square foot, which is about 3.2 watts per square foot. Uh, these numbers might have been a little bit lower, even lower than this, if I had more time. This is a class, a class project. Which one is more? Yeah, that's a good question. I think north is this way. So. The north is here, it's pointing this way. Um, again, I, this is a class project, so I didn't really have a lot of time to, uh, to, to look at the numbers. For me, as long as these numbers are lower than the, than the baseline design, that was acceptable. So uh, I, I, will, I will show you that the, the, I, the next slide will show the baseline uh, uh, parameters. Uh, lighting power density was uh, about one one point one six watt per square foot. This is average for the whole building. The building has retail spaces and office spaces that are mixed between different uh, uh, different light power, power power densities. And equipment was uh, three point five two. Uh, so this is building. This is building average for all the spaces in the building. Baseline. So uh, baseline construction was set to ASHRAE 90.1, uh, and the system was set to ASHRAE 90.1-2007, which was a package single zone uh, air conditioning unit. Uh, so average cooling, uh, average cooling load was about 500 per square per ton. Average heating load was 13, 13 uh, BTU per hour per square foot, which is for higher than the proposed design. So for me, that was acceptable to move on. Uh, set points the same. I kept the set points same as the, the proposed. This is proposed. This is the baseline set point. Lighting current densities are, are I, I modeled in both models. Lighting in the same uh, using the same method. Uh, we I use the 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 space by space uh, method in ASHRAE uh, to calculate. Uh, lighting power density, and this is the average for the whole building, uh, 1.35 watt square foot lighting. And I kept the equipment equipment the same. I didn't change it between this line and uh, proposed. So uh, comparing the energy the energy use in the buildings uh, on the left, we have the baseline. Uh, we see a lot of heating uh, in the in the red, cooling uh, almost the same between uh, proposed and. Uh, uh, most of my reduction was in heating because uh, the baseline had uh, a, uh, a package, uh, a packaged uh, air conditioning unit that uses uh, natural gas. Plus, that energy, the building envelope was set to a minimum uh, ASHRAE 90.1 requirement. When I improved the envelope to uh, ASHRAE uh, to ASHRAE 189 standard and changed my uh, system to uh, a VR, VRF system, I, 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 I show here that uh, I showed that I had a significant reduction in, in the energy and heating energy. I didn't have a lot of production and cooling. Uh, interior lighting is reduced because we, uh, we use the lower lighting power density. So that was mainly most of the reduction and also fans because uh, we had a uh, we had a huge fan in that package unit that had to deliver fan, air to all the spaces of the building. And with the VRF, we have localized units in, in every thermal zone that, uh, uh, of course, use smaller fans. And the, the efficiency is better than the package unit. So uh, the reduction, here is the reduction. I will show the values later, but we re this is our reduction in energy. Comparing, comparing baseline to uh, proposed. So our EUI for the baseline was about 99, 98 uh, uh, kBTU per square foot per year. And EUI for the proposed is about 62. And we see here uh, the reduction is about 37% in energy, uh, energy savings that mainly come from uh, heating, uh, as we showed in the previous uh, 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 slide. And I went through and compared energy uh, cost. 
I used uh, some text numbers for uh, about 70 cents per term for uh, for uh, natural gas and uh, seven, uh, six cents per uh, kilowatt hour for electricity. I just use this, these numbers to uh, try to get a feeling of we have energy savings, but what is the energy cost savings as well? Uh, here is on the left, we have the energy cost savings that uh, of course we, our, we had uh, a little bit of gas consumption in the baseline because we had heating coils, all the heating coils was uh, using uh, natural gas. Uh, so the heat, we had a big heat, a large heating coil in that package unit that served the whole building. With the other option, we had electric heating for the VRS using electricity, not natural gas. But there was a little uh, natural gas consumption in uh, service hot water. And also, we had uh, a, gas, a gas heating heating coil in the dual system. The dual unit on the roof was using a little bit of natural gas for uh, tempering the outdoor air for the uh, uh, for the building. Uh, EOI again is uh, this is this side. This is the energy side of the uh, uh, savings. EOI again is 90, uh, 98.3 went down to 62.1 in the proposed design with a reduction about 36. Uh, EOI, 36 kbtu per, per, uh, per hour per square foot, and this is about 37% of energy savings, and the cost was about 27%. So benchmarking, uh, I used one of our tools here in IDL that, uh, that takes the energy consumption of, uh, of, your, of the building and plots it against uh, a benchmark that uh, highlights Idaho average building and uh, CBSA uh, national average, and our building, this side is best, it's improved efficiency, and the other side is worst. So our building locates in, in, a, in a good place, considering that I had a very limited time to design that building. Uh, so uh, this tool also generates uh, the work score that plots your building uh, scores, gives your building a score based, based on location. Uh, and uh, provides you a, a nice uh, chart that shows where is your building located comparing to the average in Boise. This is the Boise average. And this building is located in a, in a kind of far area comparing to Boise center. So uh, our score is a little bit worse than the average. This is Boise average, about uh, 36 or something. Uh, so this is the end of my, uh, yeah. So one of one thing that Ari asked us to submit with the project is to prepare a brochure with bragging points about the building. Uh, so I put some points here to brag that. It's a central location in Boise and low utility bills. And all entitlements are completed. It wasn't completed this time, but uh, it should be completed by now. Uh, energy efficiency, uh, this doesn't really if, if this is a, a commercial brochure for a building, no one will really will care about the UI. But I put it here for the sake of the class that this building is designed with a 63 uh, UI. High, tech, uh, high, uh, high technology in heating and cooling with improved comfort and uh, daylighting control. And so th these, were, these were my uh, bragging points about my building. So with this, I'm done with the presentation. Yeah, to take any questions. I think it is built. I went online last week and they have a website now. You can, if you look up uh, Boise Tech Mall, they, it looks almost the same as uh, that rendering picture, but they had some, I think they, they, get, they get rid of that uh, at the back. That's what I want to do with it. Uh, it. I think it should be uh, open in 2014, this is going to be open in 2014. So, yeah, they got rid of that space. It's the space that didn't have doors on the plane, so <laughs> probably a good thing to do. Thanks, everybody. No, uh, I modeled it. Uh, Energy Plus had a template, uh, and I only had to uh, uh, select things in the IDF editor 
I selected uh, three items that I, I didn't have issues with it. Uh, just uh, it was easy for me to define, and that was one of the things that made me choose this system because it, it's a defined template in NG Plus, and I just it took me about five minutes to define it, and I had to uh, review some of the COPs and make sure that they make the default that the, the defaults in NG Plus make sense. But I didn't spend much time in defining it. It was really smooth and easy. Thanks. All right. Well, thank you, Sharif. And thanks again to Eric. Um, I will have evaluations here for you guys in the room. And then I think any of our online attendees will get a survey after you close out. Uh, I do want to announce that next month's BSEG will be August 27th at noon Mountain Time. And we'll be uh, hearing from Drew Crawley with Bentley. So I will send out an, announce with, an announcement with more details on that uh, within the next couple weeks. And other than that, I think that's all we have for today. So thanks, everyone, for coming. <laughs>